leaky noise, new side channel attacks, new side channel attack vectors in mixed signal IoT devices. Uh, the paper is written by Dennis Gennard, um, Jonas Krauta, and Mehdi Tahuri. I'm lucky this time, the names are either German or Persian, and I have uh, experience in both languages. <laughs> and now Dennis is giving the talk. Okay, uh, Amir, thanks for your introduction. So um, you might ask yourself, what do we mean with leaky noise? So um, is it something that leaks? Is it some noise? And if we combine it, it's noise that leaks information. So yes, that's what we mean. It's, um, I mean, you could say, okay, every side channel attack has some noisy data. But what we mean is that nowadays, most of the chips are actually mixed signal chips. So if we look at a modern chip, we have, oh, sorry. We have analog and digital components where the digital part is causing noise, while the analog part is sensitive to noise. And in the future, we consider that all the chips will be mixed signal or many chips that we are using. If you think of all these small embedded IoT devices, they combine everything in a single package, which is also cost effective. Then all these uh, chips can be networked or multi-user and connected even to the internet. Now, if you consider we have two components in this chip that are actually, actually isolated on the logical level, they maybe introduce new security threats. And we wonder what that could be. So in more detail, if you look at the summary of this paper, we um, want to prove that there is an information leakage inside the chip from a digital to the analog part and potentially also back to the digital part. So um, actually the attacker can gain information from the victim through the analog part. So for example, the attacker could use an ADC, an analog to digital converter, to uh, gain information that leaks from the victim into the analog side. And the method we used to um, prove that is to sample an ADC during the operation of a cryptographic algorithm. So at the same time while it runs, we need to um, gain ADC samples. And then on this data from the ADC, we perform leakage assessment and also correlation power analysis. And in fact, um, in both cases, or we could, um, like in one case, we could actually recover the secret key. And for leakage assessment, we could also prove that most of the tested platforms are leaky. Um, next, I will come to background and related work. After that, I explain our experimental setup, explain or show our results, and finally conclude the paper. So let's come to the background. So um, probably you've heard of power distribution networks. So inside every chip, we have a complex network of resistors, capacitors, and inductors, and they need to supply um, supply the chip. So you can see, uh, maybe better like this, that um, typically we, we have a package of a chip and inside this package we have package pins. These pins, they are connected to our actual silicon dies through wires and these wires, they act as if they were um, inductors and inside the die we typically also have parasitic inductors and resistors that we balance out by adding capacitors. And in the end, this um, gets quite complex so that inside the chip, if there is some activity by any, any, let's say, an AES module that operates, it causes voltage fluctuations inside this chip. And now consider that this chip could be analog and digital and the voltage fluctuations from one side go to the other side. So in more detail, let's talk about the adversarial model we have in mind here is that we have a digital side with an attacker that can sample an ADC and a victim that runs some cryptographic algorithm. So this ADC, if we think more than just our experimental setup, this ADC can also be any other sensor. So you can, can consider even high performance chips nowadays, they add a lot of sensors inside the chip to be able to assess during runtime how the chip is performing or to see um, how the chip is aging and all kinds of sensors, for example, also temperature. So it could be more than, than just an ADC. And um, the ADC could now be legally used by the attacker while some other measures in the system prevent uh, communication between attacker and victim. And for example, this could be memory protection. 
However, the victim could leak into this analog part and ADC could acquire back this leakage or the attacker can acquire back this leakage through an ADC. In a different scenario, this attacker could also be at the outside of the system. So instead of being now a, um, an on-chip attacker, it could be an unsuspecting, unsuspecting victim that accidentally exports more or less this side channel data to the outside and the attacker could be remotely in some way. Um, now for some background that most of you know, especially uh, since of the last talk, um, you know there are power analyzes side channel attacks that can recover the secret key through power analysis or through power measurements. Specifically here we use this um, classic correlation power analysis where you correlate um, the power with a hypothesis of what you believe the power would be depending on your secret key. And we also perform leakage assessment as shown in the previous talk, not as um, a modern or more fancy method, but actually um, this basic test vector leakage assessment where we just comply, comp uh, compare a set of power traces during which we did uh, encryptions of random methods with a set of power traces where we did a set of um, fixed methods and we do only this um, normal VAX T test and the VAX T test say that to get a confidence of I think 99.99 the um, T value should be above 4.5. So, and if this is the case, we can say, okay, there is a data dependent leakage because um, we can differentiate random encryptions from uh, fixed encryptions. So, um, also to some related work. So, there was um, a work where I was also involved called Inside Job, um, where we show that inside an FPGA or FPGA SOC, there um, can be side channel leakage, which is, let's say, from digital to digital part. And through a trick with FPGA elements, we can use indirect voltage measurements to um, gain side channel leakage. So let's say in one part of the FPGA is an AES module and in the other part is a sensor. And this sensor can in fact um, do CPA to extract the secret key from, from the AES. Um, this was then extended by another group to, to FPGA SOCs where we have a CPU integrated with FPGA logic. Um, another work that you might know is screaming channels. They have already shown that there is in fact a leakage from a digital to analog part in mixed signal chips. And the analog part is here more a digital to analog converter, which is used for a radio circuit. And on the outside, um, you can use very good measurement equipment to get the side channel leakage out of this, um, out of the electromagnetic um, emanation that is on purpose coming from the, let's say, Wi-Fi, or I think it was a Bluetooth module, um, to also attack um, a circuit on the digital side of this chip. Another um, selected work that is one of the most interesting ones, for more, you can read the paper, there's more related work. Um, there's sidechain leakage across borders in which um, the authors have shown that you can do a successful power analyze attack on an I.O. port pin of the chip. So not just by measuring power, but actually you can measure how a digital pin on this chip um, is noisy in some way, and this noise can also include um, side channel information. In this work, however, what we prove is that the full loop is actually working. So it's coming from the digital side to the analog and back to the digital side in the same chip. So let's go to our experimental setup. The experimental setup was um, done on three different platforms of two vendors. One of them is an Espressive ESP32 dual core processor, which we ran at one of the default frequencies of 80 megahertz, and two boards from ST Microelectronics, where the default frequencies were 80 and 168 megahertz. Um, both vendors, in fact, recommend to use the Ember TLS library, which we also use, and we performed then the leakage assessment on AES and modular exponentiation, and later uh, CPA on AES. We also use the free Atos operating system, also suggested by, by these vendors, and the GCC compiler with some standard optimization setting. Um, so the setup looks very similar to our adversarial model in that we have a victim task that um, does an encryption, 
and we have an attacker task that does ADC measurements. So this ADC is in the analog domain, and what we have to do in the setup is typically tell um, if the ADC is connected to VDD or ground or not connected. So the ADC is in fact connected to a port pin of this microcontroller from the inside of the chip. So it has a bit of a similarity with this side channel uh, leakage across borders, but it's uh, still slightly different since it's now an analog and not a digital connection. So to simplify our setup, um, we actually add a helper signal on the encryption from the victim to the attacker task. Um, and additionally, we connect the attacker to a URAD and the victim to a URAD so that we have a URAD um, connection to our workstation PC and our workstation can now receive the ADC traces and can send encryption requests. So have, we have a very controlled setup in which we can now perform the leakage assessment or CPA on our workstation. And for the results, we also first perform the basic test. In this basic test, um, we used one of the STM boards while the ADC was not connected and we sampled now 1,000 traces. And these 1,000 traces were just of a stress test code. We measure with an oscilloscope and we have now code phases that are more stressful to the CPU and some that are more idle and if we average that, we can see from the outside um, what you would expect that we see a difference in the average voltage. And we can now also perform that with an ADC just to see if there is anything to gain and in fact we can see that if we do it internally that in the stress test phases we also see a difference in how the ADC signal looks. It's not necessarily the same level differences as for the oscilloscope but there is more noise during stress phases and less if there's no stress phase. Now if we go a bit further, this is now the prerequisite for leakage assessment. It's not the full assessment. Um, here we do the same with 1,000 traces averaged and we do fixed and random encryptions. And now if you see this, at the top you see the average from fixed traces and at the bottom random. And you can see that there probably is already from this result, we can probably say, okay, at the top it seems there is uh, some data dependent leakage that is evened out by using random data. And this is a part of um, the t-test. Um, for brevity, I will just show you the final results of this. Um, for AES, then we used 1 million traces, and for modular exponentiation, 100k traces. Not in all cases, the ADC was noisy. So sometimes if the ADC is a giving a flat line, of course, then we have no way. There's no change in data. Um, but most cases, when there was ADC noise, were actually leaky, and the t-value was um, way beyond this 4.5 threshold. And here you can see in summary that um, for various cases, at least um, for one of the cases, each of the boards had um, some leakage to assess. Here you can also see um, what we write here, that for AES, we run the ADC at a faster frequency than for modular exponentiation. So this might also play a role and potentially um, there could be still a difference if we run the ADC at the same frequency. Okay. Um, then let's come to the correlation power analysis, which you are probably more interested in, um, which we also tried on this board since it had more leakage. So as you see here, in actually all cases, out of two samples of the board, leakage assessment was successful. So we used that one and did CPA with 10 million traces, which was ciphertext based. We used some simple alignment since our, um, our um, helper signal was not um, good enough. So in the default setup, we used the same setup as for leakage assessment. Here, we had less than 25 ADC samples for the full AES, and, so, and thus we could only recover two secret key bytes with a high confidence, um, which might be because of the low samples, but of course we also just did a normal CPA attack and more advanced attacks could probably be more successful. So we also simplified the setup in which we used ADC connected to VDD, since it was also supposed to be maybe more leaky. And we had um, just 56 megahertz and no optimization, so we could sample it faster in rel relation to how fast the algorithm runs. And with 60 samples for the full AES, we could then recover six secret key bytes. And here I now show you the best correlating bytes, so at the top, um, 
in the, let's say, harder case, we needed about two million traces to say that um, we can recover um, some of the bytes. And in the second case, we needed about 500k traces. So um, as a conclusion, um, leaky noise um, is probably a problem for some systems since we have data dependent noise that leaks into the analog part and an attacker can recover back this data such that it is now feasible that attacks across security domains are possible in mixed signal chips and it could even be possible for certain remote power analysis attacks. And um, of course that is not the case for all applications but if an applica if it's unsure then our call to application developers is that you should pr try to prevent ADC use during cryptography or any use of, of reading from analog components in the chip. And our call to SOC integrators would be that um, you should consider digital noise a security risk. Since if you look at any data sheet of microcontrollers and these small SOC platforms, then what you might find is that ADC is negatively impacted from the digital part or any sensor is negatively impacted if there is too much digital parts active in the chip. However, they don't necessarily consider that this um, noise is correlated to data of this digital part. So potentially this also means that power analysis countermeasures might be um, applicable in more situations and might be required in more situations than what was thought previously. Okay, and with that, I'm done. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you for the talk. Is there any question? Okay, I have a question. Um, can you get back to, I don't remember the slide number where you um, showed you have the alignment problem. I was just writing alignment, yeah. Yeah, you so. said that you had to align them, uh, but this is a complete alignment of the whole of the trace, or is this based it on? It was just plus minus two ADC samples, in fact, but it improved the results already. Okay, but it means that the whole of the, uh, whole of the trace is shifted, it means that you don't align per clock cycle, it's just whole of the trace is the shifted. The whole trace, the okay. trace that we record. So we just post-process the traces. It's not that we did anything fancy. Okay. Um, for the first result, we still use the um, inter-task communication of free authors. So of course there can be some, some parts that don't work good enough. In the second part for, for this, we also change this by adding a, just a global variable for synchronization. Okay. So also improve the alignment a little bit. Was which, it not, okay, go on. Which still was not good enough, so we still use the alignment on, on this data. Okay. Probably because um, we are not entirely sure in just programming this microcontroller at which point in time the ADC starts sampling in relation to the software that runs. Okay. Um, is the frequency that you get, you can get data from ADC is very low? What is the frequency? It seems that when you are running at 168 megahertz, you are not able to get at that a speed, the, the data from the ADC. Um, yeah, as you see, it's not very fast. Um, there's a table, one second. Um, Yes, these were the ADC sample rates that we use differently per algorithm. Okay, this is actually not true. It's okay. But um, these were about the sample rates that we used. So for RSA, you have to consider modular exponentiation, actually. Just if you ignore the, the target algorithm, you are at the 80 megahertz, the first toolkit board, and then this you are at 100 something kilohertz. Um, what, is the, what is the slash 16? What? What is the slash 16? Um, number of I think samples? this was the amount of samples we had for okay. the AES, but it doesn't mean it's for the complete AES algorithm, it was just the amount of samples we had for that time frame. So and what was the target of the AES? It uh, was running in software, right? It was running in software on the CPU, yeah. Okay, it's all on the CPU. Which kind of implementation it was? Embed it TLS. Sorry again? Embed TLS. Okay. So okay. that is a T-table based implementation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Uh, so in one, one of your results, you showed a thousand traces to break, and then in the second, you have a million traces. So that's a uh, few orders of magnitude. Can you comment on the 
on the wide foot grain, the, the difference between those two results? Uh, not sure if I got you right. So you're asking? I believe uh, you showed our result where you, you uh, when one slide it said you, it took a thousand traces to, to break. Yeah, we used, uh, we used 10 million traces, but here you see after 2 million at least some of the bytes already correlate well. Oh, okay. I, I thought you had an earlier re result where you showed 1,000 traces to break. Uh, we just um, did it as some pre preliminary experiments. We averaged 1,000 traces. Okay. For, um, so here, it, this is 10 million for the CPA. You yes. see here it goes until 10 million. It's a factor of 1,000. And um, before, uh, for the leakage assessment, here we used just 1 million. For AES and for modular exponentiation, 100K. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think we don't have enough time if you can do it in offline. We can yeah. do it offline, thank you so much. yeah. Okay, let's thank the, all the speakers of the sessions. Uh,